Western Gypsum for insight. From Tunisia and Egypt to Libya, Jordan, and Bahrain, the past two months have brought unprecedented change and uncertainty to the Middle East. To help make sense of these latest developments, I'm joined by Thomas Carruthers, a Vice President at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thomas, thank you very much for joining me today. My pleasure. How have the demonstrations in the Middle East changed the U.S.'s outlook on the region? For example, we know that Bahrain serves as a very important strategic base for U.S. interests in the region. How will these considerations guide the administration's response? Hmm. Well, our interests haven't really changed. Our interests in regional security and our economic cooperation and other kinds of cooperation we have with uh, Middle Eastern states. But now the political situation underlying those interests has fundamentally changed. So the United States is scrambling to see what relationships are emerging in countries that are having political transitions, trying to, in a sense, consolidate or hold on to relationships that we have in countries where they're not. So this is a time of tremendous uncertainty on the part of U.S. policy. Bahrain was perceived as a relatively stable Gulf state up until when these protests began. Mm -hmm wondering, was there a particular trigger or instigator for this moment? Well, Bahrain had been stable, yet at the same time it was one of the more pluralistic political systems, especially in the Gulf comparison with the United Arab Emirates or with Saudi Arabia. It had already had a fair amount of contestation politically in its parliament and a dividing up of political life between the Shia community and the ruling Sunni minority. Mm -hmm. So Bahrain we had already watched as a country that was more in, in, in a sense caught up in political pluralism. So in a way, when these events happened elsewhere in the region, they intensified what was already a pretty active process of debate and now protest and actual struggle within Bahrain. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the pluralism in, in Bahrain, the Sunni minority and the Shia majority. How is that really, what is, how is that dynamic at work in the protests? Well, you have a Shia community, which is, you know, anywhere, depending on the measures, between 60 and 80 percent of the population, which feels, you know, historically underprivileged in terms of the uh, perquisites they have of life in a society that's relatively wealthy. They feel that the ruling majority has given them a bad deal on a variety of social, political, and economic measures. They've been pushing at this for some time. And, but now, like I say, they're energized by the sense of possibility and they're pushing a lot harder. And we saw a terrible response by the regime, very crude and violent and primitive in some ways, which has only deepened their sense that this is something that historically has to be corrected. So these are potentially very, uh, you know, extraordinary events in Bahrain, which in some ways mimic a little bit uh, what's happened in Iraq, where you had a Sunni majority, mm -hmm. a, uh, sorry, a Sunni minority and a Shia majority, and then because of the U.S. intervention, a transformation of the balance of power in the society. So Bahrain does watch that, in some ways probably thinks it may be facing a similar moment. Moving to Libya, which has mm. a very different set of demographics, it's almost entirely Sunni mm. Muslim, I'm wondering, will that be a uni uniting factor for mm. these protests, and do you see that at work there? We know so little about Libya, but we do know that it's been just an extremely harsh totalitarian mm. country where political opposition, civil society, any independent groups have been stamped out. And so what we're really seeing is a protest movement that has little organizational base. Of course, there's a little bit of the presence of the Muslim Brotherhood there. But in general, Libya is an atomized society. These protests are extremely spontaneous. It's a very combustible situation. And we really didn't, don't know on what basis they're organizing other than their common anger at the regime, their frustration of daily life. So we don't know whether the, the cause, other than getting out the people who they feel have this, been misruling them, in a sense, how they will define that cause beyond that. Libya has a very weak civil society. And mm. when you take into account these protests, the anger, how do you see that working for a society that's seeking change? How do they move forward if they don't have those types of institutions? Libya is an extraordinary situation in the contrast between the just extraordinary level of repression in the country and now the sense of that cracking and breaking. In countries that, that have had a period of such harsh totalitarian rule, when protest does emerge, it has to take on a form entirely directed against the leader because there's no underlying political organizational base or civil society base. And so we see a protest movement which is probably being, in a sense, formulated organically day to day. There's been some talk that the international community should intervene in Libya. I'm wondering how the U.S. can support these efforts while not being seen to meddle in the region. 
Well, uh, when a leader is bombing, strafing, killing his people, it's time to intervene in some fashion. I don't mean military intervention, but the United States cannot be said to be meddling when we have essentially a humanitarian crisis in a country of this sort. And so I think it's up to the United States uh, to work together with its allies in Europe, with multilateral institutions like the United Nations, other places, the African Union, and really try to bring this just disgust and horror of what we're seeing there to a, to a focus and to start exert as much as possible pressure on um, both the Libyan regime, but any partners of the regime to bring pressure on them to say, you've got to stop the killings, and then you've got to give way politically and address the reforms they're talking about. Moving to Jordan, where mm. more than 2,000 people recently protested, mm. it, I'm wondering, the king of Jordan had recently sacked his cabinet in an attempt to proactively you know, mm. cut off these protests. Why are we seeing a renewal of the protests in Jordan? Well, there's anger there too, and people feel uh, that um, they want deeper change than simply, you know, shuff reshuffling of power. Most people in most Arab societies are used to seeing these kind of cabinet reshuffles, uh, mm -hmm. these kinds of changing around of ministers to try to feed the people a bone of change and say, there, that should be enough for you. So I think in Jordan there's a push to say, we've seen this movie before, we want a new movie. It doesn't mean that they want the king out. The king of Jordan still has a certain legitimacy in the society, which I think Mubarak had lost and which Ben Ali had lost. He is the, the monarch in a way and has deeper societal roots. But he is being pushed by his people to show that he can really respond to what has become this rising sentiment for deeper change. Taking into account these countries that we've been discussing, Bahrain, mm. Libya, Jordan, are there similarities between the protests in each of these countries? I think there's an underlying similarity, which is we're fed up and we're not going to take it anymore. Um, people have reached a breaking point in terms of their psychological state, and it's a, any number of accumulated frustrations that can be just the misery of everyday life, the feeling in Bahrain of being disfavored versus others, um, the humiliations that people in Libya have faced. So there, there may be different specific causes of that humiliation, frustration, but there's a common core of sentiment. What's different is the nature of the regimes. And so when that sentiment runs up against different kinds of regimes, we see different kinds of reactions, whether it's the horrendous violence that we're seeing in Libya. Some violence in Egypt, unfortunately, was scaled back. Very little violence in Tunisia. In Jordan and Morocco, more conciliation and more dialogue. So similar impulse, different response from different kinds of regimes. Well, I appreciate your time talking with me here. Thank My you very pleasure. much. Thank